He double booked. <laughs> and he came to the gates of Shepparton and um, was terrified of com coming in. And he did this, he threw his beret, his famous green beret, over the gates and did a voodoo charm to make sure we weren't going to really be nasty to him, I guess. So the, the, the afternoon was slim. The, the wide shots are actually, you have to in the toilet. It was a lot smaller than that, actually. But, um, I love things like that. I love things like that. Yeah, I love things like that more. That's more. one of the nicest things I've had. Yeah, Moon, Moon certainly did the introduction at yeah. the beginning, and she talked about how, how it sort of goes, takes us back to Soho and takes us back to Notting Hill in, in uh, the 50s. And, and then it, was, it just struck me that it's worth remembering that, that Soho and Notting Hill were both um, huge sets. The Soho set was built in it, 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 in, in studio in Shepton, and the Notting, the Notting Hill was a, was a sort of five or six acre set at the back lot of Shepton, and they're the largest and most extraordinary sets that I've worked on, I think, ever, almost. I mean, it is certainly in this country. There's a good story about the sets, actually. Um, it was the oldest trick in the book. The film was going way over budget, not way over, but over budget. <laughs> Before we began. Before we began. <laughs> and what, the, um, what uh, the producers arranged was to withhold all of the invoices for the art departments until the film was finished. Yeah, they and so, <laughs> when more. those came in... They had a heart attack. Yeah, they said, don't for a million over. <laughs> But then there was kind of like rumours whilst, I, which I've never asked this, and I hope you don't mind me asking this, Sandy, because we know each other. There was rumours whilst we were on set, because I was WC duty, which means weather cover, but it always made me laugh, because I would be there anyway, even if I wasn't used. So it was the most extraordinary summer. Um, but there was all these rumours going around saying, it's overrun on revolution. That was the, that was, it's over spent on revolution, so they're pulling the money on the sets. Is that no. just a rumor? It overran, didn't it? But we, we didn't get any money from revolution. No, get any money no, it wasn't revolution. revolution, because revolution. No, no, no. no. It wasn't. No, That's just a, um, a just a, a, a rumor that went around at the time. We got a good deal on the lighting, that was like one of the only good deals. Was that Lee Electric? From Lee Electric, because we based the Notting Hill Street on the house where we grew up, the brothers, the Lee brothers. So, they you know, gave homage to their own. Um, and that was another funny thing about watching it, was how many things you wove into it, which were of the, that, that time, of 1985, and also pertain to to the 60s and to the to, to, to your London, to our London, yeah. you know, and so and the actors that were in, so you know, J Jimmy Fox being in performance and then being in the servant, and then being in this and there was this, I mean, there was sort of all sorts of Mandy Rice Davis, Mandy Rice Davis, amazing, the way that Alan Freeman, yeah, 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 yeah. What, what's I your was a really naughty story I could tell about. It, probably. No, you're right. Yeah. Yeah. That's what you should tell Alan Freeman, right? I wanted him in the film, I don't know why, I found him so um, gauche really, but um, I really wanted him in the film, but I wanted that thing when they pull the toupee, he might have a toupee, you know. uh, and um, he, his agents were really excited, but he, he read the script and said, I'm not doing it, I'm not feeling it, I'm bald, you know, and they said, you've got to go around and talk him into it, and um, so he lived in some mansion flat in, in Ada Vale. Dorman let me up and I rang the bell. And it was this squealing and rushing around and, and rearranging. <laughs> and I come in with like four young boys sitting. Oh my God. And Alan said, I better do the film. <laughs> <laughs> Otherwise, you'll sit in front of all these and tell this. Oh, yeah. <laughs> but it was that it's really a hymn to those two islands of difference. Of, in a, a sea of kind of white bread, London, Soho, and really modern girl on, on some level. Um, and about the, the emergence of youth culture in England and, and, and the arrival of the wonderful people from the Caribbean um, who um, changed London as we never know it. Uh, 
So it was, was an attempt to take the musical form, which was always very far away from uh, you know, any, any social or cultural kind of analysis and try and weave some of those themes into a, into a musical film. It, it's interesting seeing the film again now, after Steve McQueen's um, series uh, yeah. on the BBC, yeah. to, to see you know, how far ahead you were actually in trying to tell the story, it, uh, musically, and uh, yes. very, very interesting. And, yeah, sorry, I was just going to say, and because Martin Scorsese always quotes the first shot as his inspiration, doesn't he? Have you, have you heard, heard that? Well, the, opening, that? The, long, the opening, very long, well, well, is, backwards and forwards. Has yeah. anybody seen the film called The Players? So, yes. Yeah. I felt completely vindicated. The, the, the opening of the of Robert Altman's film, The Player, um, they're at the 20th Century Fox Studios, and uh, one guy said, Hey, have you seen Absolute Beginners? It's the longest tracking shot in the history of cinema. <laughs> <laughs> so, people do appreciate it, don't they? They do, and they're very. And it's weird, I, I think I last saw it 10 years ago, and then uh, with you at yeah, the Sanctum, yeah, and, then, <laughs> and then how the world has changed again so much in the last 10 years, and we seem to have gone personally backwards, not forwards. And so seeing that, and, how, and it just like resonates in a kind of a comic way, how horrible it is now. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> no, <laughs> Do you know what I mean? Really you know, it's sort of like, um, it's sort of like, I think, oh my God, that's still happening. Jesus Christ, why? why? You know, and, and there's these people, these horrible people who control us all, why? You know, and so I, I sort of, as much as the, like, the fun thing, and also the fact, the color of it. Mm. I love the color of it. Yeah. It's just, and um, I was, when I was coming here, because uh, uh, Sue, Sue Blaine, isn't it? Because nobody sort of like Sue Blaine who did the costumes and everything. I mean, she did the Rocky Horror Show. And so, and the Rocky, and when you think about it, you think how the Rocky Horror, Horror Show is so highly stylized, yeah. and then how she's highly stylized in a totally different way. Yeah. You're, you know, because all those added ingredients make it really, I want you to tell everybody, because this really fascinates me, the editing. The editing scenario. The story. The story is really, really important. Well, I've oh. never seen a film with four editors before. And they didn't, and we were thrown off the film. Sandy was our only defender um, at the time at Goldcrest. And um, as soon as we finished, we, we were thrown off. Um, and it was rather, it was kind of a vicious Why? Guy. I must stop you there just for that second. Because we were mean and ugly, because of the sex. Because of the money, okay. We didn't go to schedule. No. Okay. Um, which the producers <laughs> no, no, swore know. us all to secret, you know, don't tell the old friends or the film will never happen. It was it's kind of dodgy, yeah. <laughs> anyway, it was a nightmare because we all knew that was hanging out. It wasn't the first time. No. <laughs> no. Um, but, yeah, so we were thrown off uh, by, and, and this guy, Alan Marshall, who's no longer with us, but he was a nasty guy, you know. Um, took over and he had four editors uh, but he wouldn't let them they were in different parts of london so they didn't talk about what we were doing you know so one guy took the beginning one guy took the rest of the the and uh, <clears throat> uh, after about four months we were actually called back i don't know if you remember this over christmas they said you can go in over christmas you've got three weeks and uh, you, you know, see what you can do and try and put it back together. <laughs> and, um, but you can't reprint anything, which was a problem because the uh, opening shot that we've just been talking about had been cut up into thousands of bits. We, we don't want that long opening shot. We'll just chop it up. And, and they'd lost, you know, frames, you know, under the carpet. We were finding them. In, you know, uh, so most of the three weeks were spent <laughs> putting that opening shot together. Um, <laughs> so it, yeah, it's, it's a bizarre, um, this bizarre story. I think we asked for it in a sense because we hyped the film and to get it made, we had to we had to show that the story at that time in the British industry wasn't 
really using young filmmakers, so um, it's kind of <laughs> thing of busting in through the gates. Mm. And, you shot um, the um, the Ray Davis song first, didn't you? Before a year before, the yeah. Of photography. Mm. Yeah. Um, yeah. Um, at, at Twickenham, I know famous films to you, but um, yeah, so we hyped it, you know, we, we got stories in the NME and then the face and we'd go into meetings saying, look, they're all talking about Colin McGuinness, absolute Guinness, you know, you've got to make the story of your teenage, um, and um, it, it snowballed, you know, so by the time the film came out, it had already been reviewed by Lots of people hadn't seen it, and there were cartoons in the, in the national press about this is the destruction of the British film industry, um, uh, which is kind of a nice thing to think you're capable of. But um, <laughs> <laughs> don't think it wasn't much really of an industry to destroy. <laughs> what about the um, other thing that I've always led to believe as well? Sorry to ask these different questions. I've always wanted you shot um, Eddie O'Connell, who played Colin. On the bridge at the at the Albert Bridge, yeah, a month or so, or two, or in between the premiere and the, not the premiere, the when you the first screening and the premiere. Yes, we did a bit of fiddling, fiddling around, reshoots. Well, right, right, And was that because because this is another thing that I've probably made up in my mind because MTV was so popular at the time it was that, that, that so many bands made it mainly because of their videos not yeah. their not the song the visual and i always thought it was because at mtv uh, somebody a hit big, who i don't know who thought we'll make our money back by it being like a long empty you know like a long music video basically with all the most fantastic music i don't know I think, I think you just made that up. Oh, I think, I think, I think. <laughs> you sound <laughs> good though. It's it's good. Good. So I like the I like idea. Paul Weller did it. Good like story it. though. Yeah, oh yeah, Paul Story did it. I like the Paul Weller song a lot. Yeah. Oh, what you mean? He um, he wrote think, it late. I think he sent it in late. Yeah. <laughs> It's <laughs> tame. <laughs> but when you put when you put that in, was there had someone had what have they said? To, I mean, out of interest in terms of how these things work, had somebody had they said to you, we need more, mm, or we need less, we need no, see no, no, no. without resorts or something. We always wanted the song, but um, it hadn't arrived. Right, 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 right. And it's what a great song. Yeah, it's great. Yeah. It's a, a little bit of an irony, isn't there? I remember talking to Eddie, Eddie um, O'Connell after it was made, and he said he got so drunk every single night after shooting that he used to sleep on the sets. Yeah, he slept on the sets. He was traumatized by Patsy's treatment of him. Patsy's? Patsy thought she was, he was below her. Being a bird's eye, Pete's advert star. <laughs> <laughs> and Patsy was praying every night while, while Eddie was drunk, sleeping. She was praying to be famous. He had this weird little shrine. It's very bizarre. And yet, in, in the film, he, he says that he doesn't drink. That's the irony. Yeah, yeah I can see why he drank on the film. <laughs> so why he slept on the set. So was there difficult chemistry between your two romantic leads? There was very little chemistry. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, I have to say, I did want um, Tim Roth, but he was oh. being too ugly. Oh. They used to say he was too ugly. Goldcrest, I think. Not Sandy. Uh, right, yes, Goldcrest. Yes. Let's ask. Let's ask. No, the, the, not, I, not to put down Eddie. Well, no, no, no. Well, I think Eddie is well, much more I, I never wrote that Tim Roth was in the running. Oh, well, we had a few oh. in the running. Mm. He was shot, but there was a whole film shoot about six months before it was shot. Do you remember? There was a film, sh um, uh, people were Tim Roth, uh, uh, all different sorts of people were, were shot before that they were in the running for the film. Subs, I think, was being mentioned. Um, Matt Dillon, definitely. Oh, oh my God, Matt Dillon. Matt Dillon. Good. New York. Oh, Subs yeah. so, 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 got out of it by breaking his toe, I think. Oh, I love that story. 
I'll elaborate it. <laughs> no, 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 I don't know how to elaborate it now, but I will have a think about it. Of course, then his toe was gangrenous. <laughs> It's a typical Sugg's excuse. It is. <laughs> Sorry, I my Did you have any ownership of the film as a director to re-edit at your leisure, you know, as it is? Um, if, I, so if, so if I go through long periods of, of um, unemployment, I do think about it, because Patsy keeps telling me she's got, you know, bankers and oil shakes and the oligarchs who might have yeah, yeah. stupid <laughs> money for charity. Yeah, yeah. Let's remake it. Yeah, we could re-edit it. Re-edit. Re-edit. You had to direct Hours of film. No, just remake it with everybody a lot older. Yeah, the dance numbers would be great. Absolutely beginners. <laughs> well, the dance numbers were pretty good fun. They were wonderful. Oh, yeah. <laughs> he was a great choreographer. David Chagori. David His assistant, Bruno Tony. Became yeah. massive. Oh, oh, yeah. Who's, 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 who's yeah. the, the Randy yeah. Lodger in Ray Davis's house? <laughs> long, is... long before uh, Trisha <laughs> came out. Who was the uh, little girl who mixed the suitcase out of the car? Oh, very beautiful. Do you remember who that was? The little girl on set. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So when they're burning the house, like she, she goes and tries to mix the briefcase with the, with the development of the... Yeah, yeah, no, because that's, that's, and that's something, she's from his daughter or something. I can imagine that she was. Yeah. 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 But I couldn't think of what it was, no. Everyone's somebody's daughter. Yeah, but of course not. Yeah. Yeah. Someone. Yeah. 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 Someone. Yeah. Yeah. Well, some of them one might have known, because there were lots of people who were there, because you knew them and they were friends, yeah, you know, and that's why it was... I mean, Sandy was, Ma Sandy Shaw was married to Nick, Nick, Powell. Nick Powell, who was one of the producers. He used to come to the door, he used to come to the door, he would go and see and she would come to the door in her dressing gown. Fantastic. <laughs> Did she have her shoes on? Or was she barefoot? <laughs> <laughs> Nick Powell, bang on her. I mean, sadly, it's no longer with us. The Steve Woolley's stood about, isn't it? The ponytail one. Yeah. The pony. Yeah. The ponytail. <laughs> Eddie, he didn't say that. The ponytail. <laughs> <laughs> There's no editors. We haven't. We can't afford four editors. <laughs> the pony. Get the job done very quickly. <laughs> Overnight. Has anybody got any questions? I've got a question. You sort of alluded to it already, but do you feel that the the sort of publicity around the film? spiraled out of control. Totally, totally, yeah, it snowballed and we were responsible because we, we pushed it insanely to get it made and... Um, Do you think ultimately though that sort of set you up to fail in a way? Well, it, I, it didn't help. <coughs> I, I, I my, you know, my thing now is I wouldn't talk about anything before you've done it really. But I remember um, being very excited to be asked to be a part of it. And then uh, we hadn't started shooting, and I picked up a copy of Time Out, and it had 20 reasons. It had Julian hadn't started filming. It hadn't even. To it, hate time, it. It said, no, it said 20 reasons why not to watch Absolute oh, Beginners. Yeah. Wow. Oh my God! It hasn't been filmed. And it has so that's, that's and Tony memory. Elliott is yeah. a friend of There were of lots Sandy's. of reviews. Julie Birchall was really poisonous about it. Had I not seen it? Oh, it's bizarre. So, that taints it a lot. I mean, I don't know how many films get reviewed before anyone sees it. That's my memory. It's quite unusual. It was, time, it? <laughs> it was almost so like there was this huge publicity around it before it had even been made. Yeah. It was almost like, you know, expectations were so high. It, was, it, would be almost, it would be almost impossible to sort of deliver on it. Well, that was partly as well. Goldcrest was saying we're going to relaunch the British film industry with Revolution, Mission. And this old we almost piece. killed it. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um. No, we, but it, no, you didn't. That, that's I have to say that you, what you actually did was inject a magic that what could you know? Never mind even in the end, but a magic of that things could be. You know, this taken from us all the time. Oh, you can't do that, you can't do that, you can't, you know. And I think, oh my God, no. We have to come to a point where we go, come on, 
you know, we come on, we can. I've oh, not got much money, can then fling that over there, let's do that. Do you know what I mean? Just just do it. Because but I think it was also the pre runner to making England or London seem groovy. You know, London wasn't really that groovy in the 80s, was it? Because everybody was about New York. It was, it was groovy in the 70s. Groovy at the end of the 70s. The late 70s. It was really groovy in the 70s. Yeah. In the late 70s, but that's the mid 80s. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, and then the, the London was at a, was like that. It wasn't a well, cool place you know, to be. Everybody wanted to be. I thought, you know, I, was I, thought I was making a film about the, the beginning of teenage culture, youth culture, at the end of it. So it's like a mirror, 85 and 58 being kind of yeah. reversed. Numerals. Um because you know with punk we had tried to do those things that uh, were kind of put back in the box um, in the beginning of the 80s. So you know, the film was was trying to you know to, to revisit and understand and make powerful again the youth culture that emerged the first time really in the 50s. And you know, we have to mention the book, it's a wonderful, wonderful snapshot of London at that time. It's not a, not a very um, deep psychological narrative, but it's, um, it's just so evocative of, of time and, and how people were feeling. Um, you know, it's a very observational book. Um, but the thing that I, you know, he says at the beginning, is there's all these kids are sailing down um, Shaftesbury Avenue on this summer evening, like gondolas, and the world is theirs. One day they'll make musicals about this. You know, so it's, it's, that's where I went wrong. But, <laughs> 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 and was, uh, was, well, did you pick up the book and read it and think, this, this will tell our story? Or did somebody come to you and say, No, no I read all you know, the other two yeah, so that Spades and, and, Spades and uh, sort of Love and Fortune. Yeah. 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 So, do you know where the footage is if you uh, were to be given the opportunity to re-edit it? It's in a vault, I'm sure. Most of them are in the vault. Yeah. No, I'm sure I don't know who's involved, it's in. Would you want to? Would you, would you want to re-write If I had nothing else to do, I could yeah. engage. Does it? Yeah. What does it sort of mean that the that it was on film, film that it was actually snipped as compared to what it's like done now? Is that a great big rigmarole? Is there still the stuff? You know, do do we still have the machines to be able to do that? Uh, we do we transfer. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Mm. but it is Dickensian technology. Actually, it was seventy mil, bizarrely. Yeah. I saw it in um, the, our Radio City musical. Um, it's a funny story because that was the US premiere. And I, I, I don't know why, but I've, I've been up there now doing something and they got me a Concorde in those days. Of the oh, wow, I like that. They get me there for this premiere in the evening in New York. And um, some guy reading Gaddafi's little green book on, in the plane. So there was all this mad stuff <laughs> going on. And it was around the time that Reagan bombed Libya, I think, you know, it was that time. So it was, Hypersensitive, and um, they they were talking, you know, walking, connected radio, whatever, with, with JFK, and they wouldn't let them know. So we circled around in a concord around JFK while this premier, you know, I was supposed to be there at seven o'clock, it's six thirty. I was still flying around in the air, um, and then you know, then they finally said they're running out of fuel. <laughs> so they had to land and, and they wheeled this guy off. He was everyone was saying it's got after his little green book or whatever, but I, I think in the end it wasn't. But I had to then get to Radio City Musical in like 20 minutes, and, um, and I hadn't got any dollars. It was a oh, crazy expensive suitcase. And I finally got there, and um, uh, yeah. Amazing thing to watch it in 70 mil because you saw all the suitcases that the film cases that had been uh, left on the set at the back of the shop. <laughs> <laughs> oh my god! <laughs> 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 the detail. Like, what am I watching? <clears throat> <clears throat> <clears throat> <clears throat> <clears throat> <clears throat> 
I think well, I still love the film. I think the colours and everything is fabulous. Yeah, yeah. Well, there's some great shots in it. And the choreography. Yeah, yeah. I love yeah. the fantastic. Well, all, all of yeah. them. I think we should have been the dance. That's what. And nobody. And I love the fact that we, you know, because David Bowie is um, such a huge Bowie, such a huge iconic figure to everyone. Uh, you know, what was that? He contacted you, didn't he, to do it? No, I contacted him. <laughs> 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 but I already worked with him. You know, I, uh, you yeah. know, I I've done some videos with him. But um, I did say, do you want to pay the the anti pope, Disney anti pope, or something, some weird thing? He said, yeah. <laughs> see, he was going to be a copywriter, like all those all those rock stars, like Keith Richards. They were like, trained to be commercial artists and. Oh, I didn't know that. So he was obsessed. He loved that book, Ben just partners. Of, uh, what was it? I don't know. What's his name? Ben Hidden Persuaders. Vance Packard. Yes. Oh, yeah. That was the book. So Ben just partners was a kind of play on Vance Packard, and then that was mm. the fate that David thought he'd avoided. So he was keen to play this person he could have been, mm. which was interesting. They're rather prophetic, because of course White City yeah, has been yeah, totally yeah. developed. Yeah. Yeah. That's what I thought as well. And the little flyover model with the little cars on it. Yeah. How yeah. amazing was that? <laughs> if you think what's happened. It's not like Westfield, yeah. yeah. Just like a well, nightmare. Was the beginning of the West, though, wasn't it? I was assuming. Yes. Yeah. 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 But it's funny all well, that area around Notting Hill, where, which was originally built as a kind of Victorian speculative, kind of high-end, you know, housing project for for, for, for the wealthy and the the, the well-heeled, the successful of London, and it was built on a sort of series of rivers, underground rivers, and the whole thing was very jerry-built, and so it, yeah, and it was all subsiding all over the place, which is why it kind of fell into disuse and not for its initial purpose. Well, it's also great now that the oligarchs put in their swimming pools, the whole terrace is like... <laughs> <laughs> but the, 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 the Notting Hill that, that you were focusing on, Colin McInnes was focusing on, and, the, and the, I, we, and like Sophie was saying, you know, one caught the tail end of, was a kind of disruption in itself. I mean, it was not what it was built for. It wasn't the purpose it was built for. And it's only in the last sort of 20 years that the, the kind of the commercial aspect is, that somebody in the mid 19th century had a vision for has actually come to fruition. And all these houses that were multi occupancy right. were, were now rank as single that, family that unit right houses. Enough. I mean, it is you know, one of the greatest urban planning yeah. things yeah. in Europe, really. It's an amazing thing. It's very sad how it's got them in the around. You know. No, well, it's, yeah. I mean, it's, it, it, it is a shame. But then again, in that sort of in that Holland Park back, I can't remember what the street's called. But, but they were, you know, some of the some of the worst housing in, in London. Or something. Right. Yeah, all of that around sort of Notting Hill Dale and stuff like that. Yeah, yeah and I mean, it, it was terrible. And um, yeah. and now it's it's not. And, and that sort of that kind of housing has been been eradicated. Um, I, I still hang out there because I've been like work there and stuff, and it's really changed out of yeah. all recognition, really. Anyway, mm. it's all moved east, as Malcolm McLaren prophesied. <laughs> <laughs> Did he say that? Oh, yes. Go east, young man. <laughs> <laughs> And yet, it was so funny. In the um, 70s and 80s, everyone, people would say, there's a party, and we'd go, hooray! And we'd go, where? And they'd go, Hackney, and we'd go, oh. oh. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that was my party. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. But I have to say, the film would not have even got to where it got to without Sandy, because he, he was a great champion. And, I think even when we got fired, he was trying to get us back on it, and he was always the only nice guy. Oh. <laughs> oh. Very generous of you to say that. Well, you've all got to watch Sandy's film. Yes, what's what is this all about? It's half the length of the Beatles' Get Back. 
Take me four hours long. <laughs> That's only the first part. First part. <laughs> the Boyle Heights is. What is the this? Street uh, Boy of Boyle Heights. Yeah, what, you must tell me what this is. It, is it a, do a document? Are you making the documentary? No, it's been made. It's been sent to me. I haven't, had, I haven't got four hours to. Who's made it? Week, but I will watch it at the weekend. Yeah, who's made it, Sandy? I'm called Paul Cronin. American person. No, he's British, but he lives in New York. Right. And he does documentaries and writes a book about books about films and filmmakers. And oh, I love it. Mm -hmm. I'll find out your and hidden when is that coming out? It doesn't come out. He just posts <laughs> it on um, Vimeo. Oh, okay. So anybody can watch it. Okay, so the global we'll watch release. it on Vimeo and find out more about Sandy. That's brilliant. Oh, that is really brilliant. Mm. Yeah. Okay, great. Well, thank you, everybody, for coming here. Unless, or have you got another question? Anybody got any more questions? Um, I was just saying, I really love the fact that you did um, incorporate into your set studios lots of um, iconic um, uh, locations mm -hmm. which were real, like the two eyes. It was the and, most magical and, set and because it was all the best bits. Of so it was really great. Yeah, yeah. And, oh, it, and even the way the set was set up was almost recognisable. Mm -hmm. said, it's John Bid. Yeah. John Bid's the yeah. Where well, the plaque kept coming up on the side of the building, Percy Shelley. Yeah. Where could I be? Where is it? I know it, I know it, I know it, but do you remember Broad, where it is? Broadwick Street. Yeah. Broadwick. Broadwick Street. Thank you very much. Well, it's Tavi de actually, is that? Bar Italia. Oh, that's they were closing down by, I've, I've got three cappuccinos for life in the Bar Italia, because I said, don't change it. Yeah, they yeah, bore, they bore, two years later, they had a thousand people on the street yeah. outside. Had you worked with Oliver Stapleton before? Yeah, I've done lots of videos. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, it's a brilliant, and we, brilliant collaboration. We were, we were building up to this kind of look uh, through the video. Where you could and do a lot of things. Actually, I'm having a lunch with him tomorrow because they want to do, they're doing Blu-ray Birth Girls that I did with him. So I'm going to see Oliver for the first time in a long time tomorrow. Okay. But your oh, offices, when that was being done, was in Soho, wasn't it? Yeah, above. At the time? It was above, what it was it Love Joys? It was the, or Denny's. Denny's, the Denny's. catering. Uh, oh, really? oh. Where all the chefs got their hands. Yeah. <laughs> and their apron. It's not there anymore. It was brilliant. It had a roof garden. It had been a nightclub in the 20s. The roof garden was still these weird. Um, oh, is it still there? Trellis is rotting banquettes. Oh my god. Yeah, it's amazing. It's in the film, isn't it? We show it. Yeah, you have nice you do. Is there a nitrate? Yeah. 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 Well, I think that's the end. Um, that thank you it. very, very much, all of you, well, for coming. You. I'm saying all of you for coming. And thank you very much, all of you, for coming. <laughs> and being part of this um, a very special little chat. There's lots of gossip in there. There is. <laughs> <laughs> you know where that came from. <laughs> You've only scratched the surface. <laughs> 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 collaboration because it was everybody's um, you know zoom put together with a different uh, and it's sort of become it's sort of like gone all viral it has <laughs> but then I suppose it would do if Prue Leith was playing her mother because it's sort of what she is and so therefore uh, who's only four years older than Debbie because Debbie's <laughs> <that's it. laughs> so it's science fiction so therefore you can do what you want but um yeah, so it's all about the casting as well. <laughs> Quite a lot. Yeah, no, no, it is. <laughs> no, but, you know, as soon as you say blondie, everyone goes mental. Yeah. <laughs> Quite rightly. Very blondie. Yeah.
No, quite rightly. So um, no, and so and so it keeps. So the next, the next thing you'll see me in is a, a documentary with me with no teeth. <laughs> you go go. I used to do it. I used to be. And then you rang your chain across.